Wolfgang, I see that you have put a jacket. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I am impressed. <laughs> my, my concession to a classic diplomatic. <laughs> <laughs> Good morning. Good morning from Brussels and welcome to the nearly 400 registered participants and viewers uh, on live stream on YouTube. My name is Stephen Blockmans. I'm a director of research at SEPS and on behalf of our partners, the Swedish Institute of European Policy Studies, CIEPS, and the Brussels office of the Friedrich Hebert Stiftung, it is my pleasure to, to welcome you and the speakers to today's public launch of the report of the high-level task force with codename EES 2.0. The report marks the 10th anniversary of the European External Action Service and assesses the, the actual and potential contribution of the European Action Service to forging a more active, coherent and visible EU foreign policy. Obviously, the timing of such a debate is, is particularly apt due to the rapid global geopolitical contestation and trends that we witness, with which the EU is confronted. And if it wasn't clear or enough already, um, then a series of recent high profile diplomatic incidents have made it plain for everyone to see that the European Union needs to act as a cohesive force to avoid being outmaneuvered by major powers. And yet uh, EU institutions and member states are still struggling to set aside their differences and focus on the common interest. And despite significant achievements, the European External Action Service, in our independent view, still suffers from a lack of buy-in from member states uh, and other parts of the EU administration. Now, building on the fruitful cooperation between CEPs and SEPs in 2012-2013, uh, which led to the publication of a legal commentary on the foundational council decision of 2010, as well as a set of recommendations to amend it, our institutes have joined forces to consider how the role and functioning of the European Action Service can better serve the common interests of the European Union and fulfill its objectives in external action. And led by the EES's first Executive Secretary General, Pierre Vimont, a high level, gender and geographically balanced group of diplomats, former diplomats, officials of EU institutions and member states, both at their respective headquarters and in the field, as well as NGO representatives, academics and think tankers have conducted an independent review of the first decade of the EES's operation. Of course, considering the, the defects in the services original design, learning also from experience, the changing nature of diplomacy, and building upon the achievements of the past decade, our task force report formulates 30 recommendations with a view to assisting the EEAS in moving from a state of self-doubt to one of self-assurance by better fulfilling its mission and updating its modus operandi. The report contains many concrete and actionable ideas to imbue the service with more flexibility to think, propose and act, more agility to factor in a rapidly changing international landscape, and more determination to put the Union in a leading role. The report is not a review of external action in substantive policy terms. It is a review of the role of the EES as an actor in the EU foreign policy family, and therefore primarily institutional in nature, at the service of substantive policies. And so it tries to find a niche by being complementary also to a raft of existing ideas and new initiatives, uh, from the Meseberg Declaration to the so-called Copenhagen 9 non-paper, the strategic compass process, and it offers an independent view, as I mentioned. Now, today's proceedings will unfold in two parts. First, we will hear from Ambassador Pierre Vimont, who is currently Senior Associate Researcher at Carnegie Europe, the key findings and uh, priority recommendations of the task force. 
we are grateful for the willingness of the current Secretary General of the EES, Stefano Sanino, to offer his reaction to the report and to lift the veil on some of the preliminary findings collected from the EES's own internal review. And then in the second part of this event, Pierre and Stefano will be joined for a roundtable discussion by four distinguished panelists, whom I will briefly introduce at that stage. Christophe Lyon, who is a senior researcher at CIEPS and professor of law at the University of Oslo, but in this context, most crucially, a co-rapporteur of the task force, is ready to answer any questions pertaining to the report. Our online audience is very much encouraged to use the Q&A function in Zoom to pose their questions. I suppose you all by now know what that means. Please make sure to identify yourself uh, to address your question to one or the other panelist. We will curate the Q&A box and try and do justice to your interventions by clustering and blending them into debate. So with that, Pierre, the floor is yours. Please try and restrict your opening remarks to 10, 12 minutes. I will give you a, a subtle sign when you're approaching the end of that. Thank you. Um, thank you, Stephen, for inviting me to, um, uh, to this discussion. And I'm very pleased to see uh, many friends on, on the screen, unfortunately on the screen, as we can't uh, be all together in, in Brussels. Um, and let me also um, congratulate Stefano, the new Secretary General, and wish him all the best. Um, I did this already privately, but I'll do it again <laughs> publicly, and I wish him uh, great success in his um, uh, great uh, mission. Um, I, I have no intention, Stephen, if only to, uh, because of the uh, time limitation, um, to go through a comprehensive presentation of all the um, conclusions or recommendation of the task force. Um, I can only invite everyone to read the report. <laughs> it's, um, it's worth uh, uh, reading, um, uh, mainly because of what you did, Stephen and Christophe, in, in, in drafting this uh, report. I only will give you a few overall remarks of a, of a more political nature, if I, if I may, to, um, to launch the discussion. And I will make three main remarks. First one, I think what the report did, at least it tried to do, was to reappraise uh, the EES uh, purpose and, and functions. Uh, um, and uh, one point that came out vividly was that the EES was not an institution, but a service uh, uh, with uh, uh, functions like coordinating, um, uh, bringing new ideas, um, playing uh, or being the external representation of the EU. But the real question, I think, behind this assessment was, what is the added value um, of the ES uh, today uh, uh, as, a, as a service? Um, and what I think one of the conclusions we came to was that the added value of the ES was all about geopolitics. Um, at the moment when we are talking about a sovereign Europe, a geopolitical Europe, Europe that must speak the language of power. Um, I quote here um, Joseph Borrell, uh, Mrs. van der Leyen, Charles Michel. Um, the real added value is that the uh, external action service, in my opinion, should be a sort of um, a control tower for a geopolitical Europe and should position itself as such. And of course, this has uh, implications, uh, implications for the way it is organized and is functioning, um, not trying to compete with uh, all others in line uh, directorates in the commission or uh, with the expertise that may be in the member states, uh, but bringing its own expertise, its own geopolitical expertise that can act as um, an inspiration for what is being done by all institution. Um, it has also to connect um, with all the components of the external action service in order precisely to get a good situational awareness um, 
of the geopolitical world we're living in, um, to have all the necessary intelligence and information. And as you were saying, Stephen, to able to think, propose, and help to decide uh, on all this information that is gathered, which means among other things, um, uh, to avoid the silo system. We have um, seen time and again the silo syndrome that we see all too often in EU institution, working more closely with EU delegation, which is one of the real successes of the um, EEAS um, uh, implementation, uh, and having uh, clearly a flow of information and ideas and interacting uh, between all the different elements of the EES. Uh, the other implication, of course, is to be able to draft uh, strategies and bring new ideas um, to the whole institutional uh, framework of the European Union. New ideas, I think, is the real resource, added valued resource uh, of today. Mm -hmm. Um, in a world that is more and more complicated, where multilaterally, multipolarity tries to trump um, uh, global um, power politics um, and uh, the risk of a new Cold War, um, Europe must be able to come up with new ideas. And the EES is the one that can factor in these new ideas. And I think that is really what's at the heart of the mission of the ES in the years ahead. Second uh, recommendation, and I'll move quickly, uh, precisely in order to do that, uh, Europe must invent its own brand of diplomacy. Um, uh, one of the problems, I think a sort of catch-22 situation we're facing today is the following. EU member states are more and more of the opinion that the Lisbon Treaty hasn't delivered um, the kind of EU foreign policy they were looking for. I don't, I'm not trying to blame either the member states or the EU institution. I think this is one of the assessments one can make, a sort of overall disenchantment uh, at the moment with EU uh, foreign policy, in spite of some real successes that are here and there. Um, so in front of that, um, the risk is that member states will go back to their own national foreign policy. And then member states have to recognize that this doesn't work either. Um, and that, you know, going on your own in today's world, when you are a medium size or small European nation, is not the way through and the way forward for any kind of successful foreign policy. So we need to get back and work together to invent a new brand of EU foreign policy that can really show its, um, its agility, uh, its capacity to be proactive, and its capacity, I think, to invent something that is missing in today's world, in today's geopolitical world. Um, you know, this whole conflict inside Europe about whether we should go for principles and values or for interest needs to be overcome. And Europe can find a synthesis that will be very useful for all our partners over the world on the future of multilateralism, on how to defend and promote human rights in a less uh, Western-centered, inspired uh, diplomacy, uh, but a diplomacy more open to understanding the um, experience, the democratic experience of other countries around the world. Think about uh, uh, Japan, Australia, uh, or other countries um, in Latin America and elsewhere. Um, think about uh, how also looking at ourselves, uh, to invent a way of protecting Europe and defending European security all over its continent and having um, a neighborhood policy, Eastern partnership or Southern neighborhood policy uh, that take into account the realities of today's world. Um, I think this is really what is missing at the moment and where the EES can bring a very useful um, contribution in um, going forward with uh, communication, formal and informal, that create a brainstorming, a debate among member states 
uh, to live up to the rea geopolitical realities of today. I could go on and on, but I will not because it would take too much time. But I think this is, in our opinion, inside the task force uh, that made this report, the uh, way forward for the external action service. And my third um, uh, remark would be maybe a more personal one. I think that the EES staff must understand that the challenges that are faced, they are facing are of course somewhat specific to the very complicated EU institutional system. But um, to reassure uh, the, my former colleagues in the EES, they have to know that these challenges are very familiar also to national ministries of foreign affairs. All diplomacies around the world are struggling with these problems. Um, diplomatic expertise has now to compete with strong expertise inside all the inline ministerial department in each government. Um, in the EU member states, expertise in the finance ministry and the transport ministry with regard to European affairs is just as um, brilliant and well performing as the expertise inside the um, foreign uh, services in member states. So what national foreign services are trying to invent is also their own brand of expertise. And that is once again, all about geopolitics. And maybe one advice I would give in the end is go for more cross fertilization between the EES and national diplomatic services. Go for lessons learned, peer reviews, um, exchange of experience, good practices uh, in all fields, organization, uh, functioning, um, uh, uh, tailoring of uh, strategies, uh, so on and so forth. Uh, that's the way I think one should proceed to see how we can benefit from each other's experience. I'll stop there, Stephen, and look forward for the discussion now and for what uh, Stefano Sanino has to say about this report. Thank you. Thank you, Pierre, and also for segueing straight to Stefano. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, Stephen, and um, thanks to uh, Pierre and to all the other colleagues who have accepted uh, this invitation uh, um, this morning. And, uh, um, I have to say uh, uh, that I have read very carefully your uh, report and more than once, uh, because somehow I thought that the, uh, uh, the, the, the members of this panel uh, um, had, um, had a direct experience of what this machinery is. And uh, um, so I thought it was a, would have been a good source of inspiration for uh, the work that I... Uh, had launched and which is essentially very much uh, in line with uh, um, uh, what you have done. And that's why I mean, I thought that it was a very good occasion to do the two things together, to uh, present your, uh, uh, your report, but also to give you a sense of the work that we are doing. And you will see that the essential uh, um, it resonates uh, a lot uh, in, the, uh, uh, in, in, in what we are doing. Um, uh, the, um, uh, I, I will focus essentially really on the structure and machinery. I mean, I would say very little about geopolitics or policies. Um, I will speak a lot about, let's say, how the, uh, the, the, the machinery, how the structure can help delivering uh, what we uh, would like to do, the content. Because the, the risk is that uh, if we are not having a structure which is in phase, with the kind of um, policies that we want to implement, it will be um, uh, difficult to, uh, uh, to be effective. So essentially, uh, at the beginning of January, when I was appointed, was my day. The first thing that I did to uh, launch a sort of internal reflection process within the IS involving old staff. I mean, so very horizontal, very flat, no real, uh, um, not hierarchical. Um, and uh, I started asking questions very uh, banal about the um, identity of the IS, um, administrative culture, um, how we work with institution, uh, uh, how we work internally, which would uh, the feeling of what should be the role of delegations. And, and the, the idea behind it was really 
how we can rethink the system. Is what we have in place is really appropriate for doing the job that we need to do in this new reality, or it is something that uh, um, needs to be changed, adjusted, or, or revised. And uh, coming from all these different contributions that have received, essentially I have focused progressively on a number of issues. And I mean, I'm not going to put everything on the table today because some are really very internal about, I don't know, a, a new way of working internally in the, in the new normal or the communication challenge that we have, and we do have a communication challenge and so on. So I, I will um, like to uh, uh, focus on three uh, um, points, which is the mission statement, uh, what it, what we are uh, and what we should do. Uh, the working methods, both in Brussels and in uh, and delegations, and the way the EIS is working with the, uh, the other institutions. Um, starting with the, with the mission, uh, with the, uh, what uh, in uh, your report you define as the political mandate, which has been, uh, it is true, is missing in the decision establishing the, uh, uh, the EIS. Um, and it's very interesting, uh, Pierre, because you have started with exactly the same word that I'm using very often, that is to say, we are a service, we are not an institution. And I want, and the ambition I think that we should have is that of being the service for all the institutions. Um, if you see at the Article 2 of the decision, um, it is clearly said that the EIS should support the high representative in performing his mandate, but it also says that he shall assist the President of the Council and the President of the Commission uh, in uh, their respective functions in uh, the area of external relations. So, I mean, to recuperate in a way also the spirit of what it should have been, that you don't need to replicate structures outside the EIS, because we are not only the, uh, at the service of one person, we are at service of the system. Uh, and that's, I think it's important to, uh, um, to, uh, um, to put in uh, as a starting point. Because if this is true, then, I mean, uh, to perform our tasks, we need to support and we need to count also on the support and the trust of the institutions that uh, uh, that we are serving and that comes my uh, uh, second uh, uh, let's say key word that is added value if we want to uh, 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 let's say render a service then we have to, we have to add something otherwise it's there is no point to uh, uh, to turning to uh, uh, to us and which means that essentially we have to be able to put results on the top of the agenda. So <clears throat> let's be a little bit less worried about prerogatives and more focused on uh, what we need to do. Um, I think that th this was also something that was very clearly uh, stated in, uh, in your report. We need to ensure the coherence of our collective action in, uh, in, uh, in foreign policy. And if you want to have coherence, you need to work with the others. You need to cooperate with the other institutions. Um, so it's the point is not, let's say, defending, uh, it's not uh, closing, but on the other, on the contrary, it's opening and going to, uh, um, uh, to the others. And this is even more true, and as you were rightly saying now, uh, Pierre, because the uh, foreign policy uh, has become something which is, goes well beyond crisis management. Uh, the, uh, it's been a little bit the traditional way uh, through which foreign ministers were running uh, their foreign policy. Um, where essentially the political director was at the core of the uh, structure of, uh, of a ministry. And now we have, I mean, if you just think a number of debates which are going on in the European Union, which are central when it comes to foreign policy, it's about strategic autonomy, uh, it's about the weaponization of uh, um, policies. Um, it's about uh, uh, 5G. It's about uh, 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 migration or um, a screening of investments. And the point is, and, and more and more, and this is the interesting thing, the more and more the, all these policies that we are developing within the European Union, from uh, deforestation uh, towards uh, farm to fork uh, or to uh, um, uh, digital, all this is having a very huge impact on third countries. 
And this is where I think uh, uh, we need to come in because we need to bring the, this external dimension to avoid a uh, borrow an expression of uh, a um, uh, friend and colleague who said to avoid that the geopolitical uh, commission can turn into an ego political commission um, because it is true that the risk is that, that an inward looking uh, uh, posture can uh, can become problematic and and say and often says that team europe starts here starts in brussels and then I mean, it moves on to the uh, to the member states, but uh, within the institutions, we need to be able to, uh, to work much more together. So that's for me, it's the first element which is essential when it comes to the, uh, the mission statement. The second one, and you have mentioned it today, and I am uh, I say using very much the expression that uh, um, uh, you have uh, uh, coined for the uh, report, that is to say that the IS has to become a factory of ideas. And that's a, 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 a very good point. We need to be able to initiate the political debate. We need to be able to uh, uh, inject, let's say, ideas into, uh, uh, into the system. Um, we have already in-house a quite unique set of expertise because we have uh, uh, colleagues coming from uh, uh, institutions, different institutions, mainly commission, but also the council secretariat of the European Parliament. We have colleagues coming from national administration, national diplomats. We have uh, military staff, we have police staff, we have the intelligence. We have a wealth of uh, expertise that uh, um, it's, it's very quite relevant. The real challenge is also how to make them work together, how to avoid that even within this own structure, they are working separately uh, uh, and how to uh, um, overcome the, the silo <coughs> mentality. And the uh, uh, link to that is also the question of the uh, foresight dimension. How can we be able to uh, uh, have scenarios about the uh, um, uh, about the future and how this element can uh, be linked in with the way uh, we also communicate uh, what we are we are willing to do. Um, the second aspect, and so that's very much about the uh, um, uh, the mission. The second aspect is about the working methods, and uh, there too, there are I think a number of uh, elements that you have identified in, uh, in in your report, and that we have identified collectively. By the way, what I'm saying is not the result of only my reflection. Eh? This is the result of a really collective effort where we have brought we put together uh, contributions which have come from from all quarters of the house, uh, trying, then trying to distillate. But just to give you an idea, we have received a shorter, longer, more than 700 written contributions from, uh, uh, from within uh, the house. So uh, working methods, first of all, uh, I think it's something which was, uh, uh, and I, I very much agree with this, uh, how we can enhance a culture of information sharing rather than a culture where you retain information. That's an a, a important point, especially in house, which is, let's say, so big like, um, uh, like this one, how you can empower through information the whole of the structure, how they can not only be the, I would say, the privilege of a limited number of people, uh, but how you can have much create a bottom-up approach. Yeah. Uh, the second point is about, let's say, how to shorten the chains of command. Uh, this, is, this is a structure which is, has been for quite some time top heavy, mm -hmm. where the uh, uh, far from being a flat of organization on the, on, on the contrary. So a little bit of lightening this uh, coordination structure is, uh, um, is key if we want also to get, let's say, the different forces coming up with the, uh, the uh, um, analytical and uh, um, ideas uh, on different things. Um, and then one point that for me, it's, uh, uh, it's very important and is, is not yet really uh, uh, developed sufficiently in, uh, in the house is how 
we can connect more the agenda of the EIS to the strategic agenda of the uh, European Union. And I go back to what I was saying before about crisis management and going beyond crisis management. How we can deal with the issues like green, digital, migration, health, eh? by the way, this is uh, something that, uh, and how we can link much better the thematic and the geographic where the, uh, we are as EIS much stronger on the geographic, like foreign ministers usually are, uh, and the commission is much stronger on the thematic, but how we can create a link between uh, the two? Where is the, uh, uh, the, the element that can uh, bring these uh, two elements um, together? Um, uh, one issue that uh, I uh, um, want to uh, make, uh, because you have made very clearly this point, and it, is, uh, uh, it has come out very uh, uh, prominently in, uh, um, in our internal discussion, is the uh, security and interoperability of communication. Stephen, in another meeting that we have had recently, I was mentioning this, and, uh, and I do believe that is a key point, because especially in uh, the new uh, uh, under the new working methods we do need to have let's say a, a system which is much more secure and can help us to uh, uh, to work more um, cooperatively and that brings me to uh, uh, the other point about the delegations and you were making this point pierre i fully agree with you that delegation is uh, if I may say so, the real strength of the uh, um, uh, of the EIS. Um, I'm half jokingly saying that if tomorrow uh, we would go back to the uh, system of, uh, let's say, having the EIS as one uh, uh, DG of the uh, Commission, um, the, the delegation should be uh, still remain. Uh, and still remain as they are. Huh? So no longer a, um, an element, let's say, a mechanism, a tool of uh, um, development or of assistance or of trade or enlargement, but much more as a foreign policy actor as they have become much more. And, and there I say, there has been a buying in of uh, all the different actors, be it the commission or the, uh, the member states. Uh, our stakeholders, eh, if I can call them so. Um, so the, uh, how can we enhance the role of the, uh, um, of the delegations? How can uh, empower the ambassadors so that they can uh, uh, manage their results? That is to say, having in mind what the, uh, uh, the task that they are given, rather than, uh, let's say, managing the resources coming from different DGs. And again, we go back to the silos mentality and to the uh, um, how to work more in uh, with the matric organizations, uh, on, um, uh, with teams working on projects and promoting uh, cross-section work. Um, the interaction between uh, delegation and embassies of member states uh, is of key importance. We have developed this concept, uh, Team Europe, that I think catches quite well the objective of uh, this integrated approach, but it's something that we need to uh, um, uh, develop much more. And it is interesting that um, the role of delegation is important both for countries who have uh, embassies on the ground, but I would say even more so for countries that do not have embassies on the ground. They, they see the delegations as their hub eh, and the potential uh, uh, work that they can do, uh, um, can do for them. Um, third aspect that I want to uh, um, highlight is how we can work better with the institutions. And again, the name of the game is cooperation, uh, cooperation and more cooperation. Um, I think that there is one element that I, um, I, uh, it's very relevant. Uh, you have said in, uh, in, uh, in different ways also in, uh, in your report. I uh, let me put it this way, how we can strengthen the coherence on the filiere that goes from the European Council to the Foreign Affairs Council, to COREPER, to PSC, to the working groups, and back from the working groups to the European Council. That is to say, how we can ensure the implementation and the follow-up of the decisions that are taken by the heads of state and of government, but also how we can feed and uh, uh, provide inputs to uh, uh, the heads of state and government through this uh, through this field. Um, one thing that I think uh, um, um, 
has been maybe not worked sufficiently. Uh, we have, let's say, uh, um, give, we have given preference to the PSC, which was our body, uh, because we were controlling, uh, we had the permanent chair of the PSC. We have worked less in a less uh, um, intense way with Coreper. Also because for, for quite some time, uh, Coreper was really delegate, delegating foreign policy issues to, uh, uh, to PSC. Now I have, I have to say that Going back to Coreper, it has struck me how much uh, Coreper is involved in uh, in, uh, in foreign policy, and uh, I think that we need to use this, and I think it's a good thing because at the end of the day, this is really where you can connect the dots of the different policies of the uh, European Union, and. Uh, one can feed also this process through a number of policy papers and we go to the idea of the uh, factory of ideas that uh, um, we have discussed before. The uh, second uh, area where we need to uh, do uh, more is the commission. I was saying before we have, let's say, in a way, not developed sufficiently the need to interface and interact with the commission we do not have at least up until now i would like to uh, I'd say to remedy this a structure within the eis which is devoted for being the interface to uh, uh, with, uh, with the commission there is now an instrument that has been created with the, uh, the von der Leyen Commission, that is EXCO, which is this committee uh, no, that is bringing together Commission and, and the EIS. Uh, it's a very useful as a clearing house, but I think that the role can be enhanced. How I think it can be enhanced also the role of the Group of Commission for Stronger Europe, uh, the, uh, to be really the, uh, uh, the strategic uh, the place where all the different components uh, um, uh, of the external dimension can, uh, can get together. Um, and finally, uh, it's, and it's not only because it's uh, less relevant, the work with European Parliament, I have found that the, uh, uh, the, the Parliament is very eager to, uh, uh, say, to, to develop its role in this area, but a sort of very honest and transparent communication with them and in, in a sort of constructive spirit can help a lot to, uh, um, uh, to do the work. And last but not least, and I think that this is really another important point, even if this is not an institution, but we need to work much more with the, call it however you want, it's civil society, with the academia, with the think tanks, with NGOs, with the journalists, with media. We need to be able to, how to say, to be more transparent, more able to uh, uh, communicate our messages and also to get from outside, I mean, the sense of what is perceived and what is the external perception. Um, I want to make, uh, uh, sorry, two final points and then, and then I will shut. Uh, one about the uh, need to turn the DEIS into a real European diplomatic service. And this goes very much, and again, this is an element that you have developed quite a lot in, uh, in your paper, about the esprit de corps. Huh? It's, the, um, it's many things. It's uh, on the one hand, the corporate identity that uh, um, it's still lacking. I know that it's difficult because there are different components, but still we need to, uh, to work on that. Um, it's about, let's say, uh, pre-posting. You were um, also suggesting the idea of pre-posting training before starting working, so you get a better sense of the, how the system works, is how integrating more the, uh, uh, the resources. And then again, that's something that you have said about how the, the, the permeability between member states and the IS. And I would say also between the commission and the IS, eh? because until now we have a system which is quite a sort of straight jacket because if you have commission officials joining the EIS, then they have to leave the commission. So if we have a secondment schemes by which people can come in and then go back to the commission, that can be uh, um, extremely, uh, uh, I think, cross-fertilizing. Mm -hmm. um, and also another thing, how to bring in a, an expertise which goes beyond the diplomatic expertise. I think that the idea of having only diplomats being seconded to the uh, EIS should be uh, overcome. We should bring in also different kind of expertise. And last but not least, what you say about the European Diplomatic Academic Program, which is a very good idea. 
And uh, um, someone has said something even more ambitious about uh, creating a sort of Erasmus for um, young diplomats. And I would like to understand if with the uh, College of Europe, we can manage to uh, uh, put something in place in, uh, in that perspective. The last thing that I want to mention is the gender dimension, because this is, a, a, and uh, I've tried to broaden the, uh, the scope to a, uh, gender and, uh, um, sorry, the gender and diversity dimension. So to broaden the scope, not only focusing on gender, which is very important, both the internal and the external dimension, what is done here to, uh, let's say, uh, have a more balanced presence of women in the structure, but also the kind of activities that we can do in order to implement you know, the gender action plan or the uh, um, resolution on women, uh, um, peace and security. But there are, this is something that we need to create a whole of the uh, yes approach on, uh, on this. Um, much has been done, uh, much needs to be done in order to uh, um, improve this, uh, uh, this situation. I will stop there. Sorry, it was a little bit long, but um, uh, really this has taken me a lot of enthusiasm and I see that there is enthusiasm around and I uh, wanted to uh, share it with you today. Many thanks, uh, Stefano, for your kind words, also for your close reading of the task force report and for sharing your, uh, your detailed um, actionable ideas on, on how to go forward on, on the structural front, as you mentioned. Well, um, there's a lot to digest. Fortunately, we're helped uh, by four uh, distinguished panelists to, to move the debate even further. We'll briefly introduce them. Um, Ambassador Wolfgang Ischinger, who is of course known to all as the chairman of the Munich Security Conference since 2008, after having served among many other functions as German ambassador to the United States and before that as, as deputy foreign minister. Uh, we're happy to welcome uh, back uh, René Jones Boss, a member of the task force and former Secretary General of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, as well as Ambassador uh, of the Netherlands to the United States and Russia. Uh, welcome also to Uda Sletnes, uh, Ambassador of Norway to France, previously at the Mission of Norway uh, to the EU in, in Brussels. And last but certainly not least, uh, Vesela Cerneva, uh, Deputy Director of the European Council on Foreign Relations and Head of ECFR's SOFIA office. So as I mentioned, the, the idea uh, for the second part of the event is, is really to have a more interactive roundtable type of debate. So no long speeches, please. Um, also leave time, uh, therefore, to, to entertain questions from the online audience. Perhaps, uh, Ambassador Inschinger, I can, I can start with you uh, and ask you about your reflections um, of everything you've heard. Uh, what stands out for you as the number one priority and, and what do you think is, is needed to achieve it? Thank you. I needed to unmute myself. It always takes takes a couple of seconds for me. Uh, thank you very much. And I'm, I'm thrilled to be part of this discussion today. I've always thought that uh, the creation of the EAS was in a very important milestone in the development of um, foreign policy as a, as a fundamental element that had been lacking to some degree in the European Union uh, uh, until that moment when it was created. So uh, to put it bluntly, I feel that if we had not had this service, as you call it, um, it would desperately need to be created now. Uh, like Pierre, I've been around for a long time and I remember the first foreign policy paper under the uh, supervision of Javier Solana in 2003, when, uh, uh, and that policy paper uh, described the purpose of uh, the foreign policy of the European Union to create a ring of friendly states. Uh, 
to create a ring of friendly states around the European Union. Um, I, we cannot blame the uh, European Union for the failure to create a ring of friendly states, but effectively what we have today is of course more like a ring of fire. And that makes a credible and capable and effective foreign policy uh, urgently necessary, more urgently than may have been the case 10, 15, 20 years ago. So I'm very much in favor of, of this effort uh, to think about how to strengthen it. And, and let me just very briefly, I know I, I, don't, I have only a couple of minutes, but let me throw out just a, a, a three or four I, ideas and, and, and I have two specific recommendations. First, and this is, of course, uh, uh, it sounds quite banal, but it is not irrelevant. Whatever we can implement in terms of these 30 very interesting recommendations, this, the, the, the strength of this service and its reputation will, at the end of the day, depend on the content of policy of the European Union. If the European Union does not have a credible and clear and one voice policy on, on Venezuela, uh, you, you can, you know, you, you can do somersaults and you will still not uh, achieve uh, what you want to achieve, namely a policy objective um, for the European Union. So policy content matters. And my question is, uh, are there ways in which uh, the service could, uh, could contribute even more than it is currently doing that to um, helping to create uh, the, the conditionalities for the European Union to speak with one voice, even on, on difficult and complicated issues? Um, my point is that there are, even if one hates to say this, it's politically probably totally incorrect for me to say this, but there are of course qualitative differences of huge significance between member states when it comes to foreign policy. There are a few member states which are capable of, of, of uh, implementing what I would call operational foreign policy they can, and sometimes they do that, and sometimes they do it erroneously. Uh, they can intervene uh, politically, economically, even militarily in foreign lands. Um, there are other uh, member states, uh, small member states, very small member states, which don't even have a single neighbor because they happen to be islands, uh, which are really quite powerless, except for their own uh, you know, a direct uh, neighborhood. So the differences are enormous and, and these differences in terms of strategic outlook, when I think of Pierre Vimont's French background where France still thinks in global terms with French, the French Navy being deployed in the South Pacific and elsewhere around the world. And other countries uh, have no idea what the situation is in the South. South Pacific. In other words, we have, uh, and that that is the difference between foreign policy and uh, the essential work of the Commission. We have huge gaps in this area. So, what can be done to close the gap? I think the um, uh, the service can make a contribution by pointing out these differences, by um, presenting to the member states, to the, uh, to the, foreign, to the foreign affairs council, uh, but also abroad uh, among the ambassadors, among the embassies of, of the European Union in foreign countries can present uh, better than any individual uh, member uh, diplomatic representation could do that, uh, the, the, the differences in view and can try to create um, the, the preconditions for working towards, towards a consensual view on the foreign policy challenges. Uh, 
again, I, I, I hate to be too long, but I have one very important personal experience going back to the 1990s, which I, for me was key in understanding what the problem is. When I served at the, with the German embassy in Paris during the years of the outbreak of the Balkan Wars in the early 90s, I often went home for family reasons to Bonn to see family and friends. Uh, uh, so I was in Germany for the weekends and then I was in Paris in, um, uh, during the week working there. Um, the war that had broken out in, um, between Serbia and Croatia and Slovenia and, and, and so on was a very, very different war looking at it from Paris as compared to looking at it from Berlin. The war presented in Paris was a war of the Serbian army trying to defend the territorial integrity of, of, of Yugoslavia against irredentist movements. The war seen on German television screens was a war of independence with these poor Croats defending their city of Vukovar uh, against the Serbian onslaught with shooting with cannons into a defenseless city. No wonder that the German and the French government at the time had huge issues, even these two alone between themselves, to agree on what, if anything, is to be done about this, what may, might be our policy options. In other words, if we don't even share the same public and policy perceptions, no wonder that it's difficult to represent the European Union with one voice. So I think that the delegations can make, I'm sure that is only a modest contribution, but they can and they should make a permanent effort to make sure that the reporting of member states embassies, let's say from Beijing or from Moscow, is not totally at odds with, with one another, but, uh, but that uh, member states reporting home should always keep in mind what the other embassies are going to report home. And, and, and the aim should be, and the EAS can encourage that, can demand that, uh, uh, that uh, awareness is created about possible differences and why they, they are there and how they could be resolved. Um, so finally, um, uh, let me uh, turn to my two suggestions. Um, Very briefly, if you can. Uh, yes, this will take just one more minute. Um, first, I think it's very important. I'm actually not sure whether the, the practice exists, but if it doesn't exist, I think it should be considered. I think it's very important that each head of delegation, before he leaves Brussels to go abroad, should receive, you know, a, a 10 page document of instructions, very precise with benchmarks. What's your objective in your first year? What's the long term objective? What are the uh, detailed instructions? And how can it be verified whether you and your team will meet these? Uh, uh, this re requires policy thinking at headquarters, but it will also keep the staff and the head of delegation on their toes going forward. We, we've introduced this in the German Foreign Service a decade ago, and it has done wonders to the effectiveness of missions. And my very last point is, a, is a, probably a, a revolutionary one, probably, uh, probably not implementable right away, but I think it should be tried. I believe that one of our foreign ministers or heads of state and government should start the practice of, you know, when they are in Beijing, for example, let me use that as an example, that they should not only be accompanied by their national amb ambassador, but they should in include in their delegation, the head of delegation of the EAS, uh, the EU ambassador, so to speak. I think that would change not only the way we deal with each other, but it would also change the way we're seen as the European Union uh, from the outside world. And I've been actually trying to get my own government to start this practice. I don't know whether that will be successful, but I think uh, uh, this idea 
of enhancing the, 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 the visible status of the ES in foreign countries is a very important one. And I think the ES deserves to be upgraded in terms of its, of its political and practical visibility. Sorry for being so long. No problem. Apologies for pushing you a little bit. Uh, actually, the, the second idea you mentioned did find some resonance in the, in the task force report. It doesn't go quite as far as you suggest, but uh, certainly stresses the linkages in the field between national delegations and indeed uh, EU representation uh, on the ground. Um, turning to, to Ambassador Jones' boss, Pierre mentions uh, some of the challenges that the ES is grappling uh, with, and which, are, which are common to all diplomatic services. Uh, the abundance of information uh, and disinformation, uh, the, the loss of the position uh, of, of foreign ministries in, in their national administration uh, as the go-to um, ministry to deal with external action. How do you see this from, from your own experience uh, at, at the Dutch ministry? And um, are there any lessons to be learned from how a Dutch MFA has, has tried to deal with them? Thank you very much, uh, Stephen. And uh, nice to see all of you. Of course, I totally agree with Pierre as the head of our task force and all the things he has said. Uh, just a few words from the bilateral perspective. Uh, we went through a very similar uh, I would say soul searching uh, at the Dutch MFA about eight, nine years ago. We came out of the financial crisis, all the budgets were cut, so all the ministries, but of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs even more, because it was thought, well, all departments have their own foreign relations, everybody has their own networks, what do we need the Ministry of Foreign Affairs for? Huh? And um, so we went through a lot of soul searching and I recognize a lot of what Stefano uh, Sanino is saying. Why are we on earth? Huh? The question of the catechism of the past. Uh, what is our raison d'être? Uh, and I think sometimes it's good to do a bit of soul searching and the 10 years is a good moment for the, for the external action service to do the same. And one way or the other, you come out to the point that you do need a Ministry of Foreign Affairs. So you do need an external action service, right? Because somewhere it needs to come together. And I think that's Pierre's uh, control tower. Uh, if everybody goes their own way, if everybody has their own foreign policy, then in the finance area, you do this, in environment, you do this, in agriculture, you do something different. It needs to come together. And I think that's the big added value of the MFA. Uh, and that's the big added value of the EAS. Uh, second, the network of missions and delegations it was mentioned by others as well. You do need to have eyes and ears in the field that really know what's going on, uh, the, the press and you get, on the one hand, we think we know a lot, but on the other hand, do we really understand? And understanding is different from, from getting lots of information. And their embassies and also the delegations of the EAS play a very important role. And the third is outreach. Yeah? And I, I really want to stress this, the importance of being there, of, of, of knowing what's going on and connecting with other parts of the world. Uh, we've been so busy with ourselves in Europe that I often heard my African and Lat Latino and, and uh, Asian colleagues say, where are you? Other ministries of foreign affairs, uh, my last posting was Moscow, Lavrov traveled around the world and visited all African countries. We were busy with ourselves. And I really think the EAS has a role to play there as well. We do need to keep on doing that outreach to the world because we have a lot to offer. And I think people still like the idea of Europe, but we need to be there and we need to use all the tools uh, that we have. Uh, last remark, in view of the time, Stephen, we developed the concept of hybrid diplomacy and we talk a lot about hybrid war, but actually we also have hybrid diplomacy because on the one hand, the world has become flat. Uh, everybody has their own networks. Uh, everybody works you know, in different, whether it's civil society or other government or institutional uh, organizations. And we need to connect all the dots. Uh, both in the flat, the horizontal world, but also in the vertical geopolitical power world. Uh, and I think that ministries of foreign affairs and the ES play a very important uh, role there, how to bring everything together and how to be very open, as uh, Stefano has also said, to all the other government institutions or institutions of the EU. 
Uh, so outreach, the importance of delegations, the importance of connecting the different dots and developing a unique brand of hybrid diplomacy uh, and being present uh, is difficult now in the, in the harsh geopolitical world that we live in. I think 10, 15 years ago, it was more automatic maybe. We could afford to be nice and to organize nice things and to... Uh, and now we need to focus more and think, what is it that we have to offer and the message that we want to bring across? As to uh, Ambassador Ishinger's point, one of the difficulties is, of course, for European countries, we have such different histories. And, and in Moscow, you could really see that. Huh? There were countries that said, well, come on, you know, the Russians are what they are. We have to have sympathy for them and understanding. And other countries that said, come on, you know, they're really dangerous to us and we need to be much more tough and we need to not accept anything they do. So it is very difficult to bring that together into one common position. But I do think the EAS has an important role to play there. And sooner or later, we will need to move more in that direction. Otherwise, you know, we will not be a player, but we will be the field that others play on. And I don't think we can afford that and we want to do that. And I saw, um, however difficult it was and however difficult the backgrounds were, by coming together all the time at the delegation uh, headquarters on different levels, whether it was human rights counselors or military attaches or uh, economic counselors or ambassadors, the more you talk together, exchange ideas, try to analyze what's going on and what we can do, you do grow eventually step by step uh, to a more uh, unified analysis in the first place. Uh, and hopefully position also eventually. Because of course for the EAS, you can reorganize whatever you want and you can be open whatever you want. But if you don't come to a, a joint analysis and understanding, it will remain very difficult. But I do see very positive signs. I do think the recommendations of the task force uh, can be helpful. And what I hear from Stefano, I do see he's making really big steps in that direction. So, uh, uh, without hope uh, and and, uh, and and drive, I don't think we won't get anywhere. And we still have a lot to offer as Europe. So a little bit of self-confidence, uh, I think, is also an important point. Thank you, Stephen. I will leave it at that. There's much more to say, but to give some time for discussion, I'll stop here. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, René, for that hybrid diplomacy. Yes. Um, we we turn to, to an outsider perspective or two rather, I should say. Uh, first, Ambassador uh, Sletnes uh, of Norway, looking from the outside in, um, as, as you continue to do also in France, what do you see? Um, how is it for, uh, for one of the EU's closest partners to cooperate on, on matters of external action? And, and what, if, what in your view is, is the top ticket item uh, that needs to be improved? Thank you very much, Stephen. Thank you very much for the invitation to participate and to provide input to this exercise, as you say, from an outsider's perspective, although a very close partner. This is uh, certainly a timely initiative, and uh, as already has been said, many ministries of foreign affairs undergo similar exercises. As for Norway, we are actually currently looking closer into how to increase the value created uh, by us abroad and at home, in particular in relation to uh, other ministries, the Prime Minister's Office, civil society and the private sector. My point of departure is a very broad definition of a foreign policy, which you also reflect on in your report and uh, in view of the many tools available for EU external action which makes it a very special partner, I think, for us all, uh, particularly the outsiders uh, and also for my own country. I have said earlier, and I'm ready to repeat it, that the EAS should not become only a letterbox or a messenger service. The expectations uh, from partners have been very high from the very beginning, and we need the EU and the EAS to play along, play along uh, on the whole range of policies, which are so important for us all. I have three points I want to make very brief, which I have taken up uh, from your um, policy proposals in the report. One crucial thing for outsiders, for partners, are the cooperation with the Commission. We do certainly agree that the EAS should not, of course, duplicate 
the work done by the Commission services, far from that. But I do think more can be done to provide political understanding, framing of policies to understand and to explain national concerns in policies such as climate and energy, trade and fisheries, migration, just to, to mention a few. These are very po powerful policies that in many ways shape the image of the European Union in countries such as Norway, and where it is very important to get things right to avoid unnecessary bad will and misunderstanding. Uh, a smaller point, but important also for uh, non-EU uh, member states is the use of the common national experts. They should, of course, not become desk officers for the country they come from, but I do think actually they can provide a bridge to the capital and also say something about, contribute to a better understanding of the situation at home and uh, also reflect together with their colleagues on the EU policy choices towards a specific country. And let me finally say something about the ambassador's role. I'm being an ambassador now for 12 years. Uh, it is extremely important and they are an important asset, but also, of course, a costly investment. <laughs> there is no doubt about that. And in the report, it looks as they could have been better used. And I do concur with the proposal that one should involve them in shaping the agenda and policies related to their host country. They should as well be it should as well be considered whether the EU delegations in some places actually could learn a little bit from the Commission representation offices in Europe. They do, many of them, a quite important job in being an information centre and they work actively, for example, with civil society. And I think more should be done actually also from the EU side uh, in foreign countries in framing information to counteract disinformation and false news and uh, to actually be active on social media uh, to, to pick up also with civil society in the country they serve. That's my three points. So thank you very much for your attention so far. Thank you very much, uh, Uda. I'm sure we'll get back to uh, to some of those points. Uh, but before, do, before we do and entertain some of the questions in the chat box, and I, I would like uh, the panelists to to have a look at them already uh, and see what uh, what appeals to you most. Uh, a question to to Vesela. Um, your your task, your primary task uh, as a think tanker, is is perhaps to to think outside of the box. So are the proposals uh, and plans that, that you know, have been uh, given the spotlight uh, today, in your opinion, are they enough to turn the ES in, into an effective, you know, factory of ideas? Um, if not, you know, what's needed? Uh, is there enough contrary thinking uh, or enough space at least, you know, for unpopular ideas? Um, could you share some of your views, please? Thank you very much, Stephen, and congratulations for this report. Also, congratulations to the task force for this work. Um, you have uh, invited me a bit to uh, act as the disruptor, <laughs> but I have to uh, make an immediate disclosure that I myself have been member of my national diplomatic service for a chunk of my career and have also tried to work on the reform of, uh, of the MFA at some point where the EAS actually served um, not only as a tool for coherence among member states on their foreign policy, but also has had a transformational role, I think also for the foreign ministries of, uh, of the newer member states. Um, and this is why I think uh, geographical representation remains key uh, also for, for that service. I mean, not looking at it only as representation within the AES, but also transferring uh, skills and knowledge back uh, to the national uh, foreign services. And EAS has clearly been extremely important uh, in the past decade on, on different portfolios. Um, uh, Serbia, Kosovo, I would mention around Russia's Ukraine invasion, uh, invasion on Iran, and so on. And I think um, in such critical moments, uh, the the ideas uh, of the external action service are very much sought after. And this is why I really um, 
uh, support, and I think this is a, a very good focus uh, to look at DAS as uh, a source of, of ideas and um, uh, kind of a tool to reframe a difficult debate among member states. <clears throat> However, I am a bit worried that we risk uh, turning EAS into uh, a too well-staffed think tank. Um, and I think in order to prevent that, um, we need uh, to focus on two things. Uh, one is timing. Uh, you, Stephen, called it agility. And I think this is extremely important uh, that the timing element, uh, for instance, in supporting new citizens abroad, which is part of the report, uh, but also in crisis uh, moments um, is there uh, that the service is, uh, is reactive. Um, my second point is on actions. Uh, and this is nothing new to, uh, to all of you on this panel. Um, but I think it's worth uh, mentioning it again. I think it was Ambassador Vimon who, who mentioned the, world, the word determination. And I think this is something that uh, we need to constantly uh, keep in mind um, uh, the AS and the European foreign policy has to produce actions. It cannot only stay with the words. I know words produce realities, but sometimes words are not enough to change realities. Um, the recent, because now coming to my disruptor role, uh, Stephen, uh, the reason uh, why I think uh, the, the, most, the recent visits uh, to Moscow and to Ankara were so um, met with so much uh, disappointment and bitterness, I think was exactly because of that, because the expectations for European foreign policy are um, higher because one expects uh, to have real, um, to, for, for European representatives to really uh, attract uh, um, serious attitude and, and, and attention and, uh, and not to become, you know, uh, subject uh, to, to others. And here's several things which I think uh, need uh, pointing out. Obviously, the, the hardest task is on the high representative who constantly uh, seeks to forge consensus uh, among member states on key portfolios. Uh, obviously, the core groups, creating core groups is a, is a, uh, is a good way forward. Um, I would mention the economic coercion tools. Um, it has been also discussed in the report. Um, the Magnitsky, the European Magnitsky Act was uh, something uh, that has to be mentioned as a, as a positive example. Um, cyber defense, a lot of the member states lack the capacity to, to do that on their own. I think the external action service can be very useful there. Um, but also externally on defense portfolios, um, there is much more need for action again, in, especially in places closer to home. Um, many of, uh, of you um, know the, the neighborhood very well. I don't need to explain to, to Stefan anything about uh, the Balkans, but obviously uh, the EU mission in Bosnia uh, needs better staffing. Obviously uh, the NATO mission in Kosovo uh, could have us could uh, benefit from a stronger uh, kind of uh, European um, ownership, if I may say so. Especially now, given the latest uh, calls for withdrawals of borders in the Balkans, I don't know um, how that sounds in Brussels, but I really feel that uh, this would be a moment also for the AS uh, to work on options and to see uh, you know, how one can really preserve um, multi-ethnicity in the neighborhood. Um, one last point, if you allow me, uh, the intelligence exchange. It has been mentioned in the report. It was mentioned also in your chat. 
Um, and here I would say intelligence exchange, not only among member states facilitated by the AS, but also with close neighbors. Uh, there is a lot of value added that one could see uh, in that, especially uh, in the Eastern and uh, Southeastern uh, neighborhoods, the uh, need for having the larger picture, um, but also having better communication and more trust vis-a-vis uh, -vis the EU is something that the AAS can be very helpful with. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much, uh, Vestela. You, you implicitly alluded to the relevant, relevant uh, nature, but also relative nature of non-papers in, in the Bosnian uh, context. Um, we have in, in, in our report, of course, suggested the idea that, uh, that the ES should come up with its own type of brand of, of paper so as to stimulate interinstitutional uh, thinking um, in, a, in a more geopolitical sense. I'm also looking at uh, co-rapporteur uh, Christophe uh, Lyon to, to see whether there might be ways, you know, to, to cluster uh, some of the ideas and, and questions that have been uh, raised in, in the chat box. Uh, Stefano, there's quite a few for you. I, I leave you uh, to digest some of them still, but Pierre, uh, perhaps turning, turning back to you uh, on this distinctly European brand of, of diplomacy, We've seen some recent uh, advances there, of course, in, in terms of conflict uh, mediation, in particular in, in Georgia. Um, is peace mediation, in a way, uh, the, the only distinctly European brand of diplomacy that you're thinking of? Uh, there, there were allusions made by, by several of the speakers um, that a defense of multilateralism is, is what the uh, EES should really have a sort of, as, as a political, geopolitical mission uh, for itself, but perhaps there's more. Um, there's plenty more. And as René was saying, um, the whole problem today in this hybrid diplomacy we're facing is to connect the dots. Uh, and uh, the reality of, um, of globalization um, is that all uh, issues uh, related to foreign policy connect with many other issues. Uh, they connect with uh, economy, they connect with uh, new technology, uh, they connect with climate change, etc., etc., And they connect, of course, with the different, um, uh, uh, the different foreign policy issues that we have to face uh, about peace and war. You were talking about, uh, um, uh, some of you were talking about West Balkans or Ukraine or some of the issues we're facing in, in, in our Eastern partnership uh, neighborhood. Um, I think two points I would, uh, I would make there uh, about this huge agenda for, for uh, the external action service and more globally for the, um, uh, for, the, um, for the EU foreign policy is that one challenge that we're facing time and again, and I think Stefano alluded to that, is that um, ministries of foreign affairs are more and more involved in crisis management and less and less in, um, in, uh, in defining uh, a strong strategic vision because they have no more time. Um, uh, and I think anyone uh, position where Stefano uh, Sanino is at the moment understands that. Uh, you have to work with urgency, with time pressure, um, and you have great difficulty in finding the uh, resources to think more long-term. And it seems to me that one of the real assets of the European Union is that it has that right at home. In other words, if we're thinking about hybrid diplomacy and the need for integrated approach, EES has at its disposal all the expertise from its colleagues in the, um, in the European Commission. Um, um, it has the expertise of the military staff and um, uh, military uh, people working uh, side by side with the um, rest of their colleagues in the EES. In other words, in a very practical and pragmatic way, um, uh, the EES has all the ingredients, all the resources 
uh, to come up with um, a strong strategic um, proposition and thinking in order to move ahead. And we should use that maybe more than we have done up, up to now. And the second point I would put forward, and I think many of you alluded to that, one of the real challenges for the EU is that um, I think uh, Stefano talked about the risk of ego political um, uh, uh, focus. Um, the problem with the EU is naval gazing. It's spending too much time on internal problems um, and they are there, rightly so, and they're difficult. But to some extent, uh, coming out of a long discussion among ourselves about how could we all agree um, between the different institution, between the institution and the member states, we have lost the impetus and the energy uh, to go in the, uh, in, into the outside world. Um, and um, we don't pay enough attention with what is going uh, around. Furthermore, could I add, uh, our partners in the outside world watch uh, us and they know very well how we work, uh, the difficulties we're facing, the divisions uh, that we're facing, because um, today transparency, um, media, uh, social network, etc., uh, provide all the necessary information. So we need to take that into account. We can't be only an inward uh, organization. Um, <laughs> that doesn't work in foreign policy. Um, we need to be outward looking uh, and to be much more active in the outside world. This is where our EU delegations are very important. And the point, the, the, I would say the small stones that Wolfgang was proposing, the uh, one or two propositions are very good ones uh, because I think it is by moving with this kind of pragmatic approach, um, adding uh, stone bricks on bricks, that we will build something that at the end of the day would look like a, a EU, a EU foreign policy and a EU uh, diplomatic service. I don't think it is through new major institutional reform because nobody wants them, nobody can think about a, a revision of the treaty. It's by step-by-step -step approach um, with uh, concrete propositions as the one put in the report or the one put forward by, um, by uh, Wolfgang that we can move forward in my opinion. Thank you, Pierre. Foreign policy at the service of, of internal policies and interests um, in that sense, and vice versa, I suppose. And um, the institutional debate we're having is, to your mind, therefore, not a mock battle, as one of the uh, commentators in the Q&A box says, uh, to avoid, um, you know, highly needed reform about transfer of competences uh, in other fields. There is, Stefano, turning to you also, this um, the, the reverse position, of course, uh, as the Commission takes on the mantle of a geopolitical actor, um, it, it perhaps takes winds, wind out of your sails. Do you think that, uh, that the different DGs, and especially those like DG Trade, where exclusive competences have been attributed to, are willing to play ball uh, with, uh, with the European Action Service? That's one question. I mean, several other questions relate to uh, the main obstacles, of course, that you see to the implementation of your ideas um, about structural change, and in particular, then, uh, the role that uh, national diplomats uh, seconded to the EES can play, um, as well as um, perhaps the handicap uh, that the EES has in the intelligence uh, sphere, which is still a bit truncated. Um, if one compares at least with the member states uh, situation, we, we have in the chat box a discussion going on there also with our task force member, uh, Gerhard Konrad. Um, so several issues uh, that you want to pick up there, Stefano, not least also the gender issues. Um, is there perhaps uh, ex you, uh, lessons to be drawn from the expertise which has been garnered uh, by, by certain member states feminist foreign policy um, and, and how would you reflect uh, the gender dimension further in, into uh, the role and functioning of the European Action Service? Quite a lot, but uh, if you could be telegraphic, I think in, uh, <laughs> that would be much appreciated in the, in the interest of time. 
Okay, I'll, I'll try my best. Um, look, I'll see the um, um, readiness of member states' commission to play ball to uh, accept the role of the AES. Um, we have to be, I have to say, this is not something that is going to be solved in a uh, um, fortnight, in the sense that uh, it's not that tomorrow all of a sudden all the external dimension of the internal policies is going to be, uh, uh, let's say, in, within the external action service remit, or that all of a sudden national diplomacy and national foreign policies will disappear and we'll have one uh, 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 common foreign policy. It's a, a, a progressive, very gradual. Well, that's why I was insisting at the beginning about the idea of putting much more the focus and the accent on result, on producing added value, to give a sense that at the end of the day, if we put these uh, um, uh, elements together, um, we can manage to do more and to do better. And that's, say, uh, uh, in a way, what is, uh, uh, it's been also quite evident during the period where the uh, number of uh, um, European nationals were stranded in, um, in third countries during the pandemic. And the uh, European Action Service actually uh, um, managed to bring the home, like I think, 600,000 people. I mean, uh, uh, bringing together the efforts on, uh, of different member states in an area, a uh, consular cooperation, where member states are very jealous of their own initiative. So I think that uh, uh, this is, we need to make an effort. I mean, this is not something that you can decide on paper. Uh, it's something that you have to uh, generate the spirit, you have to generate the willingness, the uh, uh, the interest, uh, uh, the buying in uh, of everybody. Um, maybe uh, uh, for some larger member states, uh, uh, there is more reluctancy because, as uh, uh, some have said also in the chat, there is more tradition in terms of foreign policy. But there are other smaller member states that, on the contrary, they see the advantage of having a unified uh, um, process. So I, uh, um, I think that the, there is an effort that needs to be done. There is an effort also to, um, to show the added value. There is an effort to provide some ideas, suggestions, bring in uh, uh, people. Um, the work, for example, that has been done on the um, um, policy on Russia, the five principles of the policy on China, the, the, the um, uh, partner, competitor, and rival. These are all, uh, let's say, elements that have been crystallized at the end of the day here in Brussels, taking into account the point of view of different member states. Rene has said it, and I think she's very right. I mean, we are all coming from different traditions. The perception of the threat is not the same in Madrid or in Riga. I mean, it's a completely, uh, it's completely different. And uh, I liked very much one expression that uh, um, um, Wolfgang used in one of his Twitter, that saying that at the end of the day, our effort is uh, placer l'église au milieu du village try to, uh, let's say, to find a sort of common ground where everybody can find itself. Now, the real challenge, and I think that that's where we uh, can have an added value, is how to make it sure that the, uh, in the European interest is compatible with national interest. Eh? And this is the point. I mean, there is a lot of, unfortunately, the idea of nationalism, of the fragmentation that we are uh, um, uh, going through, where you think that in order, it's, uh, that see all this as a sort of zero sum game. So essentially, if you defend your national interest, you have to go against the European interest and vice versa. We need to overcome this dichotomy and we need to be able to show that those two things are compatible among themselves and that what the frame that we are providing is good for everybody. That's it's, it's, uh, it's true for member states, but this is true also for the Commission. Um, I was uh, trying to say before, I mean, if you uh, put together all the different uh, strands of activities that we are uh, creating, I don't know, anti money laundering legislation, non cooperative jurisdiction, deforestation, farm to fork, um, and energy directives and renewables, and so on, you have an accumulation of, uh, let's say, burdens that you are putting on third country, Oof, carbon border adjustment mechanism, if we're going to get into that. So it's an accumulation of things, and we need to take this into account. Now it's migration, same story. I mean, we need to be able at a certain point to come up, and that's, I think it's our work, where we give a certain coherence to all this, and that we are also managing to uh, do it with third together with third countries, where 
the narrative that we can build is a narrative which is, once again, it's not the imposition of one vision on the others, but rather something that is uh, uh, brought together, uh, let's say, by the logic of the work that we are doing. Um, same applies for national diplomats, but that's why I'm insisting on the point, we need to do some groundwork, otherwise we think that there is a sort of silver bullet which is solving everything. We need to do some groundwork in order to convince people, to create the conditions, to generate the spirit, to generate also the spirit of the uh, um, College of Europe. I have friends that have been in the College of Europe like 40 years ago, and after 40 years, they still go out together and are friends and are able to, uh, and that's the kind of spirit that we need to uh, uh, to generate um, there are a lot of challenges i mean in, intelligence is one of those by the way there too the experience that and what i'm seeing now in the work that is being done in the uh, incense or the intelligent uh, uh, center that we have together with the military intelligence and the joint product that they are uh, uh, delivering to us. Um, and the work that has been done, for example, for the threat assessment at the basis of the uh, um, uh, work on uh, the uh, strategic compass, there too you have added value because you are bringing in different sensitivities. And this is not always easy to do, to do this way, let's say, only think nationally. Nationally, I mean, uh, um, I don't know if uh, 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 France is still as an imperial uh, um, way of thinking, uh, or Germany as an imperial way of thinking, I don't know. But the truth is that the national debates are sometimes very national. Huh? And, I mean, it's, uh, and that's also what I'll say makes Brussels a little bit different. Then we have our interinstitutional fights, then we have all our problems, but at least the approach by definition we need to take into account 27 uh, different sensitivities plus the, um, the institutional ones. So, I mean, uh, again, it's a, it's, a, it's a work in progress. I would like to make just two comments because we are going well outside the, uh, the, um, the time frame. Um, um, one concerning, uh, I'm saying a service for the institutions, I should have added, because I think that uh, uh, it's, it's a missing element, a service to our citizens. Uh, because at the end of the day, uh, this is really how we can do things for, uh, uh, for, for the people, right? for the Europeans, for all the Europeans. And broader than that, I mean, I have even the aspiration, a little bit maybe the romantic idea that we can be useful also uh, beyond the, uh, the borders of the European Union. And the last comment on gender and on the feminist foreign policy. I mean, I uh, uh, understand that it may sound uh, strange, but uh, yes, I have the ambition of having a feminist foreign policy because I do believe that gender is not only a question for women. And that's a little bit the, uh, uh, sometimes the mistake that I see uh, uh, that I would say only women can speak about women. Um, I don't know. I mean, uh, it's very important. It is true that the sensitivity uh, um, uh, is different, but we are all bringing our own experience. And I think that the diversity from all points of view, uh, racial, um, religious, um, sexual, are all elements that are, uh, let's say, creating a much broader sensitivity. And that's where I would like to work. And I would like to focus on two things mainly. One, I already said it, how to get it that this is becoming a sort of all of the service, all the highest policy, because if we have it a second afterthought, where at the end of that we have done everything, we see what we have done about the, for implementing the gender action plan or what we have done to implement the, the resolution on women, peace and security. We have to be able to really to integrate in the whole process. The second point we have now, we have uh, all kind of uh, strategies uh, implemented uh, to go to actions and make it sure that I mean things are happening and that things are done. It's not easy uh, because I mean just to give you a small example, for example, in terms of uh, 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 women in senior management position, we are competing between the EIS and the member states. 
And there is a real problem. There are not too many women which are seconded to the EIS because essentially member states have the same problem. <laughs> so they are using the capital that they have rather than sharing with us. Again, we will need there too, we will need to uh, create the conditions. We cannot solve everything by saying that tomorrow we will have 40% managers, women. We need to keep this, but we have to create the condition for tomorrow having 50 or 60, or perhaps just forgetting about how many, because it will be naturally balanced in a way. It's not always easy. That go, goes also for the geographic dimension of the uh, uh, of the IS. By the way, it's an effort that needs to be made in order to rebalance the, uh, the, the, the geographic presence, because there again, this must be perceived as a service of all the member states and not all the service of some member states. I will leave it there, but thank you very, very much, uh, Stephen, for uh, having given me this opportunity to be with you and uh, uh, also to present some of my ideas about the future of the IS. Thank you, Stefano. There is much more to discuss, but unfortunately, we've run out of time. We'd like to thank you, of course, Secretary General uh, Sanino, Ambassador Zvimo, uh, Ischinger, Jones Boss, Sletnis, also Vesela Cherneva, Christophe Lyon, all members of the audience, especially those who've contributed uh, to the Q&A. We, we did not manage to deal with all of your questions and observations, but we've taken good note. Uh, we hope to address uh, some of them in, in follow-up events that uh, the partners behind this task force, CEPs and FES and CEPs, will organize in the next few weeks. Um, you will find a link to the task force report in the in the chat box. If you haven't already consulted it, then there is much more to consume uh, there. And we hope to count on all of you to um, to progress on these issues and uh, and debate them further in the future. So, on behalf of uh, all partners and uh, our chair of the task force, Pierre Vimont, thank you very much, and hope to see you soon. Thank you.